Well, you know, if, if you lived in the 15th century um, and a bit before, you would have really noticed uh, changes in your society um, that were popping up everywhere. For example, um, you have the invention of purgatory. Um, and uh, this is explained by Jacques Le Goff as, a, as an attempt to allow Christians to become bankers because the, the cities needed money and you, you, you could, as a Catholic you could not lend money, it was sinful. So by introducing purgatory you gave them a chance to buy back their sins and this money served for the Gothic building, the Gothic uh, cathedrals. Uh, you would have noticed the invention of the printing press, uh, which created a wholly new relation with the sacred text that everybody could now read by themselves in their own language and think about it. And, and you would have noticed uh, the invention of double book counting, because the Templars, uh, with the, during the Crusades, would uh, have to send the gold to the Holy Land, and in order to avoid doing that, they invented accounting. And so when the uh, feudal lords would go uh, fighting, they would leave their supervisors and they would start using that accounting and they would, it would change their mentality about how to care for the resources. So all these things at that time didn't appear to be related. They appeared to be emergences that answered practical necessities. But if you would look back to that period from the 17th century, you would see that this was actually capitalism emerging, right? So you have different patterns that did not yet form an ecosystem. And gradually they would find each other and accounting would marry the printing press and the printing press uh, would marry um, the, the Calvinist uh, attitudes in religion. And all of this became really the, the basis of a new ecosystem. I think today we're, we're going through the same kind of period we see the invention of social lending, lending from each other. We see crowdfunding, getting investment from each other. Um, we see the reemergence of the commons as an idea of creating shared knowledge pools. Now most people would see this as just that, emerging patterns. Uh, what I'm saying is that, that they actually are already finding each other and forming the basis of a new ecosystem. So, and, and like let's say in the 20th century when you were on the left and you would say, you know, we want social society which means we have to take it over and then we were going to create it from scratch. I think now we're in a different position. I think we can already see the emergence of a post-capitalist logic within capitalism. Um, and what we need to do as a, as a left, in my opinion, is combine these patterns in, in, in a post-capitalist ecosystem and not to do this as an utopian effort from scratch but actually using what the people themselves are already inventing as an answer to the crisis. Um, and so this is kind of the basic idea. Um, so the way I see the process is that you have a crisis in the old system and both the managerial classes and the working people are trying to find solutions for their problems. And by doing that, they're reinventing other logics, which paradoxically, in the first phase, actually serve to save the old system, because it, it allows them to, to, to prolong. But at the same time, it's, it's building the contradiction within society, because these at the heart of capitalism, you now have a non-capitalist commons, with people contributing to shared pools of knowledge and not creating commodities but creating commons that are abundant and shareable. This is not capitalism. Now around that new core that is happening in the whole world, it's still private companies capturing that value for the accumulation of capital. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can create our own vehicles and so the surplus value that is created through these contributions for the commons can be the basis of a new economy. An economy where you contribute to the common good, at the same time you're a member of a cooperative and you're creating your own livelihood 
outside of the accumulation of capital, but within what I would call cooperative accumulation. Um, and I think one of the things that we have to do today is uh, build this alternative economy and see this as a basis of new commons-oriented social and political movements uh, that have a new vision of social change that is no longer centered around the state, but centered around the idea of creating the common good and creating real commons that, that bind people in new productive uh, uh, logics. At this uh, point, uh, can this happen uh, without uh, a rupture with the system? Many would claim that it's, uh, the capitalism will not uh, permit uh, these communities, these pools, uh, expanding. Well, and at the moment there will be the necessity of the rupture. Yes, but I, I you know, I, I think no social system is able to stop very deep social trends because the reason that people are creating these commons is because they have to. Uh, today we're no longer factory workers living all together all the time and creating organizations out of that. We are, uh, most of, uh, m many of us are freelancing, uh, are independent workers in the market and the network is our sociality. This is, and so all the things that, that come out of these uh, movements, the commons, is something that you need to work. Your solidarity has to come from your network. Your knowledge, your expertise has to come from your network. So it's a very natural thing to do and this is not something the system can stop. Um, but the idea of revolution um, is, um, you know, if you look at the past, it's, it's not entirely like the, the Marxist idea would have it of people taking power and then changing. What you saw happening was within the Roman system, the fuel system was being born as a real option, as an alternative. And then eventually, you know, when the Germanic invasions uh, came, they, they would make a, a deal with the Catholic Church, which was really the Roman state that survived, and would create this new system. And the same happened with the shift towards uh, capitalism. It, you know, the merchants were growing within, and the factories were growing within the old system. And then uh, eventually there would be a series of revolutions and, 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 and social movements that would change that logic. And this is going to happen, I think, in a very similar way. As we are building these alternatives and building new social and political expression, at some point this will be in increasing contradiction with the system that we know today. Um, and then, who knows what's going to happen? You know, the idea that revolution needs to be a coup d'etat is, in my view, completely wrong. It can be that but it can also be what happened in 89 with great civic mobilizations um, and without bloodshed. And so I think that the notion of revolution, we have to look at what it really means, which is a phase transition, a, a shift from one system to another, from one logic to another. How this shift is going to happen, I don't think we can really predict, because even if we look at the last time this happened around the emergence of capitalism, there was not one way we have the French Revolution, but in England it was a religious civil war. Um, in Germany it was the military who changed the, 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 the Prussian army that changed the society. Uh, in Russia it was a Tsar who liberated the serfs at the first time. So we don't really know how this you know, is going to take place. But yes, at some point, you know, now it's emergent within the system and it's captured within the system, at some moment this contradiction will lead to more radical shifts. Are there any <coughs> similarities? Of course there are, but uh, can you point out the similarities uh, of uh, the common and the commoners in different uh, areas in Europe or in the rest of the world? Yes, well, well there is a common logic to, to the, the creation of commons, which is you have at the core you have a community of contributors that are sh creating shared pools that they need for their life and their work. Um, the commons itself is abundant and one is digital. It uh, has a, a, what they call zero marginal cost of reproduction. 
whether you make one or ten thousand is the same, basically the same price. Um, so that is outside of the marketplace. But around these commons, there are all kinds of concrete needs. For example, adapting it to your needs, like software, free software is available, but you need to adapt it to your own needs. So people need to do that and, and, and you pay them for that. So labor, there's still labor being extended to do that. Um, it needs to be maintained, it needs to be installed, it needs to be integrated, it needs to be taught, certification, teaching. Uh, so all these create economies around the commons. For example, think about geography, you have open geographic commons, but you have all these applications that make it useful for different uh, niche communities, right? Uh, so this is something I call the entrepreneurial coalitions. Now, this is mostly done today in a for-profit way, still. Um, then the third player uh, that is emerging with this, this commons economy are foundations. And they're not like classic NGOs that get money and then pay people to do certain things. They are uh, like the Wikimedia Foundation, the Linux Foundation, Debian. They basically take care of the infrastructure of cooperation. They make sure it can continue over time. Uh, so the key today is the following. I am a commoner. I'm contributing to the commons. But if I want to make a living, I still need to find a job f for a company or I need to operate on the marketplace, a capitalist marketplace, as a freelancing uh, free agent. Uh, which means that the surplus value is not captured by the commoners themselves, but by, by the companies, by the private marketplace. And I think this is where we can work on. We, this is, if we can change this, we can create a new economy. Which means that, uh, so this is my proposal, and this is already happening, for example, with entities like the Catalan Integro Cooperative. So I call this open cooperatives. An open cooperative is working for the common good in, it, it, in its statutes. So it's not an external pressure from the state, it's your very own contract as a group that makes you work for the common good. For example, a solidarity cooperative for social care. Our aim is social care, that's why we are together. Multi-stakeholder, so everybody who is affected by your activity has a stake in co-producing the activity. Okay, this is new, this, didn't, this doesn't exist yet. Co-producing commons. Everything the Catalan Integral Corporate does is open. It's all open licenses. Anybody can share. So it means that as a co-op, they're not only working for themselves, they're working for everyone. Because everything they do can be reused uh, by other people. And then the fourth thing, which is um, only starting now, is the global orientation. Because now we have a nation state, which is declining. And we have big private groups, private multinationals. Um, and we have to create counter power, not just locally, not just nationally, but at the global level. Um, so we use the notion of philia, global ecosystems that create livelihoods for commons and their communities. And this should be uh, seen as a global work. So for example, the Catalan Integral Cooperative, which we are working with as P2P Foundation, um, what they do is they are building a new uh, coalition called FAIR.COP. And the idea is to create a global coalition of open cooperatives co-creating commons on a global scale. So this is the idea I'm trying to defend. So we are working with and through these productive communities to make them independent from capitalism. To prefigure the economy we want, the society we want. Now, if you project from the microeconomics, the real activities that we are doing, to the global level, what you see is a vision of a new society where civil society is at the core and is actually productive. Citizens are producing commons. You see an ethical economy which has integrated what we call externalities, environmental and social externalities are integrated in the economic production. Uh, of these open cooperatives. And then these foundations are like a prefiguration of a new state form, right? 
because they take care of the common good of that of that commons. So if we project it on a on a on a national and global scale, we come to the notion of a partner state, right? A polis, like in the Greek sense, where the people are the state, that takes care of the common good of everyone. That takes care of the social reproduction of the whole society. I think this is a, a vision of the future. I think this is a, you know, I'm not, it's not saying it is socialism, but it's the socialism, the, the socialization that we need in an era where we can create commons, where we can create shared pools. Talking about the global issue, uh, some could claim that the differences between uh, the European and the Western uh, post-industrial uh, states and uh, areas like Asia, countries in Asia like India, Thailand, uh, or even Latin America, uh, that they never achieved uh, the, the definition of the state in the way that uh, the Enlightenment uh, achieved, if we may say achieved, uh, uh, at the West. So, uh, talking about the global, the, the perception of common uh, in India or Indonesia, and the perception of the common in uh, Spain or in Germany or in France, Yes. Uh, could be contradictory, could be um, even hostile, I mean, in competition between? Um, I'm not sure it's necessarily hostile. Of course it's different because the historical conditions, the social conditions are different. I think the situation in the West is that we, we destroyed our commons. Um, so we had strong social states that certainly for my generation functioned pretty well. You know, I'm a working class person, my, both my parents were working class orphans. We had nothing, but I had free education, free medical care. So that all generations has a positive experience with the state that provided, you know, real social needs. Uh, but we didn't have any commons. We, we didn't know what it was. And it's because we have our networks today that we reinvented the commons around the notion of a digital commons. Of pouring knowledge together. In the South, I think it's different. So, first of all, the negative experience with the state on the one hand, which is you know, often a predatory, uh, privatized state that is uh, managed by private, purely private forces. But of course, we've, we've seen that in Europe as well, with Berlusconi, for example. Um, but actually also a real commons, right? And um, so they are not starting from scratch, they're starting from a real experience with real commons, pre-modern pre commons, but that, that function in, in many places, that still function. Um, so I think we will we are arriving at the commons from different starting points, but I don't see why this is, should be necessarily hostile. I think the key issue is really the state. But that's not a north-south contradiction, we have the same in the west, we have young generations which have only seen decaying neoliberal state which is only focused on repression and doesn't build anything anymore so there's also a lot of hostility uh, around the state um, in, uh, in the West so I think that's a key debate within the movement I personally you know with the idea of a partner state I think we should engage and transform the state uh, but I still believe that if you accept that you cannot from one day to another create an equal society that, that takes time, that there is a transition, then I think that um, a mechanism like the state, you know, that is a regulatory mechanism to keep uh, social uh, peace and a social contract, is a necessity because the alternative is private militias and maybe civil, uh, civil war. So I think that the idea of engaging and transforming the state, for example, like you know, the South American left it. I, I don't think it's the good solution, but it's a first attempt to deal with the state in another way. Um, and so I think in the West we will find our own uh, answer to that in the future. Uh, but I, as I told you, I, I think that if you look at those FLOSS foundations, the Free Software Foundations, the Open Design Foundations, it gives you an idea of how the state could function in the future. Because they, are, they come from the community. This is not imposed from the outside. 
it comes from the community, but it's a recognition that there is a common good, right? So I think the, the key today is how do we articulate the public and the commons? We don't want to abandon the public, in my view. We, I want to have citizens, uh, not just private, not just commoners, because a commoner only creates his own commons, right? If you are a free software developer, you don't necessarily care about ecology. So who's going to care about ecology? Another commons? No, this is a common good. You know, the environment is from everyone. So I think this is uh, the notion of the public, the notion of the citizenship is remains central. And I think, um, you know, this was also the, the Marxist critique, if you like, is that under capitalism we cannot, rea we cannot realize real citizenship uh, because we only have formal freedoms. So we still need to make them real. And this is still the emancipatory vision of the future to make everybody a real equal citizen. But the difference today with the commons is that we see citizens as a real productive person who is contributing as a citizen to the common good. And maybe we should consider the citizen's income as, as, a, as a basic right because every citizen contributes to the common good. And what about, uh, you are a lawyer, at, uh, your basic studies were uh, law, no? No, political no. science. Political science. Oh, okay. But anyway, I think you can answer to that too. Uh, what could be the um, possible, uh, or what is already, or what is in progress, or what could be the possible legislative system around the commons that will uh, sustain and support the, the right to the commons? Yes, well, um, you know, in, in the Middle Ages, right, we, we had a very similar situation. We had the serfs and many people starting to flee the feudal system into the medieval cities when they were re-emerging. And they created social charters. They became free cities because they had requirements and they negotiated with their, the kings for their independence and, and systems of self-rule around the guilds and things like that. Um, so I think it is similar today. Today we have an exodus from labor into independent net networkers. And they are creating their commons and their communities and they are creating social charters. So I consider, for example, the rules of the free software there are five rules, as a, like a social contract. Uh, then as we go on building these communities, we create rules and norms around these activities. So I think we are recreating law. We, the, these rules and norms that now work in the micro-communities can also serve as uh, to rethink uh, the global legal system. Um, so I, I think now we have private law, we have public law, and what we need to do is reconstitute commons law. Partly maybe this can come from reimagining and reconnecting um, you know, with, with the commons law from before. And I, I, I hope that historians and, law and legal uh, scholars are actually doing this. I would really like to see this, is how did it work when we still had commons? And of course we can look to the communities in the south as well. But then we are also reconstituting our, our own legal system. So I'm, I'm not pessimistic about this because, you know, law is not something that comes from the sky. It's, it's something that is a slow recognition of social realities. Law is always behind the, you know, the real social life. And we are making our own laws. Can you tell a little bit about uh, the Flock Society that is an applied uh, research? Yes. Yes. So the Flock Society project uh, was a project in Ecuador um, that was funded by three governmental institutions. And Flock means free, libre, open knowledge society. So the question was the following Can we change the economy of Ecuador from an economy that depends on finite? extractive material resources like oil and agricultural exports 
to an economy that is functioning around infinite immaterial resources like knowledge. So the idea was to constitute the economy and the society around shared pools of knowledge in every field of human activity. Open education, open science, open agriculture, open industry. So imagine agriculture not turning around privatized, patented uh, technology that the poor people in Ecuador cannot access. But there's an open pool of knowledge where the designs of the agriculture machines are globally shared, then can be downloaded and adapted and made through uh, a network of local microfactories, where the, the indigenous farmers can make their own machines ap appropriate to their own context, but benefiting from an open knowledge from the whole world. Um, and so our task was to develop, first of all, a transition strategy. How do we get there? So what we looked at was, for example, the feeding mechanisms for the commons. If you want open science, you need open access publishing to science. Material conditions. If you want to produce science, you need scientific laboratories. If you move to open hardware, open scientific hardware, you can quadruple the number of scientific labs in the country for the same investment. And we look at immaterial conditions, for example, certification. How do we recognize informal knowledge? Uh, for example, other people know how to code, but don't have a computer science diploma. Can we build an open certification system that recognizes these real skills? Um, so we did that in a pretty systematic way, and uh, the idea was to produce 18 legislative, legislative proposals and 12 pilot projects and that was done from January to June um, this in, in 2014. Um, in Ecuador itself there will be um, some progress will, will be made around these proposals because at the end uh, it wasn't clear that the government you know, considered this as a strategic priority. Uh, so they are personal at the local level that are being organized. Uh, but it also has a global function because the first time that a transition was thought through around the idea of the commons, which hadn't been done before. So one of the things I'm doing is working with commons activists in the whole world, presenting the results of the work in Ecuador and then asking p local people, well, how would you do this in your context? What, what would be different? Um, and the idea is to create a literacy, a political and policy literacy around the commons. So to actually, you know, create demands, create proposals for a commons-based society, not just for their, you know, the, the, the specific commons activity of one group, but to create a, a field where, you know, this can emerge and, f and be facilitated. And uh, the results uh, of Ecuador or in general, you know, the, the research you are, you are doing <coughs> in different countries, uh, do you think they can be partially or uh, fully um, uh, implied into the current condition in Greece, in a country that is hit by crisis? Well, it's going to take time. Um, so, you know, we're planting the seeds at this stage. Um, but I, th I think if you look at politics until, you know, 10 years ago, there's only two choices, privatize or statize, you know, I mean, nationalize uh, versus privatization. And these are very poor choices. So what we introduced was the idea that there's a third choice. There is a private sector, there's a public sector, and there's a common sector. And so as being more imaginary, imaginative, by also allowing the creation of commons, I think this would be a huge step forward. Um, then we introduce notions like public commons partnerships. Because so then we have public-private partnerships, right? So it's a private sector captures 20% extra profit from doing things that the public service should do. And they usually do it in a way which creates more inequality in society. But we can have public commons partnerships. 
that um, in which the citizens and the users co-produce public services. And so in this vision, the state guarantees a public right to say free education and free health care, but does not necessarily have to organize it itself in a bureaucratic way. It can create dynamic arrangements with, with citizenship to, to create flexible, democratic, participatory uh, public services. I think this would be a huge step forward as well. And so we talk about the commonification of public services. Now, in the current European context, parties like Syriza and Podemos, the first anti-austerity forces that could have power, they're really key for, the, for Europe's future, because if we, if we don't succeed in this, um, you know, we get uh, a neo-feudal regime where the middle class you know, is 15% maximum of the population and everybody else is, is pushed into precarity. This is, seems to be the program of the ruling class today, not just for Greece, it's for the whole of Europe. And if the only answer we have is a bureaucratic state, I think we're in a very bad shape. Uh, because people don't want this anymore. You know, they want autonomy, individual and social autonomy. So we need a partner state, which is not a state that does things for you, but enables you to do the things but creates a context in which social equality is preserved and uh, gets better over time. So I think it's a huge opportunity. You know, are these parties ready right now to do this? As a whole, probably not. But there are forces within these uh, parties that are open-minded, that are thinking about renewing their practice around the idea of the commons. Perfect. I think it's okay. Okay. Thank you.